Like I said, if I could dance, I'd be doing it right now. How you guys doing today? Yes, good day, man. I'm so glad you're here. I wanted to give a shout out to online, online here today. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I may, I may, wherever you're sitting, in the backyard and on your couch, that you'll hear from God today. We're so glad you're here. So glad you're in person with us, man. It's great to be here. Um, man, that was good. Worship is awesome, right? By the way, just so you know, I would tell you, worship, they just, they're not heathens, all right? They don't do the worship and leave. They're, they're here for whole first gathering, all right? Just say, like, they leave after worship. They're not here for the message, man. No, they, they're here first full gathering. We say, you know what? After second worship, they can they move on. So um, just in case that was in your head somewhere, all right? I'm sure you guys are not judgmental people, right? 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 Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, man, Love Week, I'm excited. Love Week's coming up. I kind of like Love Week is like training week at Radius. You want to know what Radius is about? This is your training week. We have Love Week. It is intensive training. We believe, you've heard every week, that we are a people on mission moving out in ever-widening circles to change our world. And how we are convinced that God's called us to do that is by being the visible, tangible love of Jesus. And so this week's full of that, starting with the Saturday before with Open Arms. Open Arms is a nonprofit that we partner with that brings in, like, Jay, how many units, how many people are at different organizations right now? 20-something? Almost 30 different nonprofits whose entire focus for the most part is helping those in need to get off the street and in place of having health, uh, their, their ID, all different areas. And so it's a phenomenal thing. It will kick off Love Week, the Saturday, the beginning of that. There are signups out there for that, man. Be involved in that. And then all week long, we got things going on. We got a new thing we're doing this year called where we're going to give donuts to, uh, to the teachers that are represented with the schools in our system. And so we have about 14 different teachers that go to our church. Isn't that awesome? They are our heroes, right? Uh, and so we want to show them love, and we're going to show on behalf love to the school and bring donuts, to, not for the kids to eat, wire them up, wire the teachers up. And so uh, that'll be a way looking for people to sign up to bring donuts. Like I said, uh, Casa and many other no different nonprofits will be serving this week. Plenty of ways to get involved. And then we end the week with two things. One is Locotopia. If you guys know, it's everything local in St. Pete. It's a phenomenal kind of uh, a festival that happens downtown William Park. Uh, Hundreds of local businesses come together. It's a phenomenal experience. And our food truck, the Peabody and Jelly Deli, will be there. I think it's like our fifth year of being there. And, uh, you know, our, our food truck is a nonprofit that for every sandwich we sell, we give a meal back in the community. And so we've been doing that for almost six years and 12,000 meals given away. And so this Saturday, that Saturday, the end of Love Week, we're looking for volunteers. If your dream's always been like, I've always wanted to work on a food truck, we are your people, all right? <laughs> Your dreams have come true. You can come, serve. We need about 20 people who will serve. We'll put you in two-hour shifts, but we'll need as many as we can. We'll train you on the truck. It's going to be a great time, great opportunity. And so there's a sign-up for that. Then last, uh, Richard was in first gathering, and he works at Lumen Innovative Academy, an academy that's 100% of the individuals there are in a place of need or just in struggle. And so they got to raise money for everything. And so one thing, last year we gave out, we gave them, remember we, get, we all donated shirts for prom. This year they're doing a car wash on Locotopia Week. So if you're serving, you come here first. Make your car as dirty, you know, make it dirty so you can come make it clean. Even if it's clean, come get it cleaned again because it's just a good thing, all right? For, they're going to raise money to help for getting ready for prom and getting all the uh, money for that. And so we're going to host them here. They're going to do a car wash. They're selling donuts and coffee. It's a great time. Get your fill up. Make, do something good, right? Love week, man. It's time to be tangible in our love so that we can see the difference that God has for us. I'm so excited. So excited because we're in our series. We knew uh, it's been a great series so far. If you missed the first week, I encourage you, go online. It'll be on there um, because it's such a, it's, I feel like it's a very practical. It's been on my heart for uh, six months. It's been in my mind for seven to eight years of this idea and being able to articulate that. And so, um, I, did you know, did you see it in California, uh, the lottery is $2.4 billion. There's one ticket that won it, and it's not been claimed yet. Happened in November. Could, that's crazy, right? Talk about a game changer. Whatever your thoughts are on all the money and love of money, and like that's a lot of money. You could do a lot of good with that. And I, my mind's blown that that money's sitting there unclaimed. So it made me think about, what, has there ever been someone that's never claimed a lottery ticket that won. And believe it or not, there's a lot. In fact, the largest one ever was, is in England. 
and it was at the time 64, this is in 2013, 64 million euro, which translates at the time to about $81 million ticket. One person won it, or it was actually two people, and, and one was a different country. It was actually, I mean, it was 80, it was, you know, they never claimed it. And I can't believe that, right? That's amazing. Well, I don't know if they forgot about it, they lost the ticket. Well, wouldn't you, man? You're like, I had that, I can't find my ticket. But the thought of this is this. It's already theirs. The numbers have already been given. They wrote them down. This is their money. But they've got to claim it. See where we're going? Jesus said that I have come to set you free. And the heart of this series is, although Jesus said I have come to set you free, he has invited us into the process of living in that freedom. God spoke it. God gave us something far more than $2.4 billion in, in worth. And yet for us, we don't always live in that freedom. Galatians 5.1, Paul says it like this in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And in my heart today, there are so many of us that understand that Jesus has set us free. But many of us struggle to actually live in that freedom. In fact, some of us, of our friends and, and in our own life, we have doubted our faith. We've walked away from the church because we said, we believe this is what God said. He gave us freedom, but I'm not experiencing that. And I begin to think, what is wrong with me, which is religion? I'm not good enough. You can never do good enough. Or what's wrong with God? Does God even exist and people walk away? But the truth of the matter is, it is not that just God has set us free. It is that he invites us into the partnership of stepping and living in that freedom. It is up, it is partnered with us. And this is not new to God. God's always done that. Think about, as I said last week, remember that God said he was going to set Israel free at Egypt. God had no problem doing that on his own. He could have done that, but he chose to partner with a man named Moses in the process of getting Israel out of slavery. God's always in a process. Like you say, man, I've, I've tried church. I grew up in church and it just doesn't work. I don't, I'm not, they're talking about this, singing about this. This person acts like I got it all together, but I don't have it together. And why am I not living what scripture says? Why can I not experience peace and freedom and joy? Why am I living in bitterness, guilt, shame, anger? Maybe there's something wrong with me. And, and Paul says, no, no, no. Here is how you and me can live in the freedom. This is the heart of our series. We looked at it last week. Romans 12, 2 says this. He says, here's how you do it. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Conform was the idea of fitting a mold. It's not about trying harder, right? That's what we feel like. I got to do better. I got to try harder. It's not about changing my actions. Paul says, if you want to live in the freedom that Christ died for, then you'll be transformed. How? Everybody say it with me. Renewing of your mind. Let's say that again. Everybody with me? Renewing of our mind. Right? But here's the truth that Paul says. Yes, Christ has set us free. Let me be very clear. At the heart of radius is Jesus Christ. He is the genesis and the revelation of our faith. He is the person. He is the person who is God, who came in flesh, died on a cross, died and was buried in a grave and rose again three days later because he is the one that actually sets us free. See, my problem is not a behavior problem. The Bible says I am dead in my trespasses. I'm not alive. And Jesus come to, came to give me life. It is in him alone. I cannot work that. I cannot make that happen on my own. Jesus does that. But, he then invites you and me to say, okay, I received that. Now I need to live in that. And Paul says it's not being conformed, not fitting the standard. You got to fit the mold. Got to go to church. Got to do the robot thing, right? It is I need to be transformed by renewing my mind. Now here's what's super cool. This is just not a spiritual principle. This is actually a physical practice. I guarantee you've been in church somewhere in your life, you renew your mind. You're like, well, is the Holy Spirit going to sprinkle some pixie dust? What's going to happen? I'm going to have this glow-in-the-dark moment. What's going to happen? And Paul says, no, no, no. I've given you, God said, I've given you everything you need to live the life that I've called you to. 
And I am the creator, and I've created your mind to actually work. And so I've been reading a book by Dr. Caroline Leaf. I've been reading it multiple times, trying to process all about it, because it is the heart of the science of this message series. There's scripture and there's science, and she has been a neuroscientist for 30 plus years, and her whole focus is, it started off in the 80s by saying, can we change the way we think? Are we slaves by our genetics and by our experience, or do we have the ability as humans to change how we think? And she has studied and, and come together in the book called Who Switched Off My Brain. If you haven't got that, I encourage you to read it. And talking about the idea that thoughts are real things. They take up real estate in our mind. I think we have a picture of what a thought construct, construct looks like. This is a thought. It's something that takes up real estate. These are your thoughts. And at the fruit of each of these thoughts are our emotions and our actions. Because how we think is about how we experience life right? And a group of these thoughts together, right, become a forest. And that force of thoughts becomes our attitude and our mindset. You're following? And so it is vital we understand that we can change these, that we're not a victim to how we think, that we physically have the ability to change our thinking because, as I said, our thinking determines everything about how we experience life. Paul said like this in Romans chapter 5, or Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 5, this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature, everybody's next word, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So go to the next verse. So letting your sinful nature control your what? Mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your what? Mind leads to life and peace. Sign me up. Choosing A or B, I choose B. You say, I don't, how do I, I don't die. No, 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 we experience death every day when we live in a place of toxic thoughts. We lose death of dreams, death of relationships, death of who we are. Things die around us all the time. And Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, look, 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 this is my heart for you today. You don't have to live here. It is something that you, through the power of God, has given you that you can change how you think because how you think will determine your experience of life. And aren't you ready for that? I mean, if you grew up in church, I know you're ready because I've heard it preached every day since I was four. And I, didn't, I felt like there was something wrong with me. Why can I not just step into that freedom? Why am I ruled by anxiety? Why do I have fear? Why do I have so much... Uh, animosity in my life, how much, so much guilt and shame, why? And I, and I believe this about Jesus, is, and, I, and I've accepted him, and yet I don't live there. And Paul says it's not about trying harder. It's about changing how you think. That's hope. Well, I don't know if that's scripture. No, it's, 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 if you look at the New Testament and then the Old Testament, there is so much scripture that talks about how we think, thinking on things. It is the source it is the place of our faith. So it is imperative. It's imperative that if you and me want to live the life that Christ called us to live, we got to change our thinking. You know what? It takes work. You have me up there, right? I like the message to that point. <laughs> it takes hard work. It takes effort. There's things that get me going on, on, social, on like social media. When I see transformations, like this person looked like this and now looks like that, or this backyard looked like that and now it looks like this. This house, like back in the day, extreme home house makeover thing, me and Amanda were glued to that TV show. We could not wait to see. The, anybody with me? We like to see transformation, right? And I can get drilled down on especially looking at backyard transformations, like what it used to look like and what it looks like. I got one I found online. It's just, this is before picture. This is the after picture. I mean, that's amazing, right? Don't we just like something that's like, ooh, I like that. I want my backyard to look like that. But you want know something? That picture, it took work. It took intention. It took effort. And it took time. Let me say that again. It took intention. It took effort. And it took time. But if you want to see the backyard transform from this to this, it's called process. Our mind looks like the front picture so many times. It's a mess. Y'all with me? 
I mean, I feel like my mind goes all over the place. I got emotions coming in from every direction. It seems like my backyard's a mess up here. The same thing's true. To cultivate our mind, to manicure our mind, it takes process. It takes intention, it takes effort, and it takes time. But it's worth it. Because if I could talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, I would say this, I don't want us to live in this bondage anymore. You don't have to live in anger and anxiety. You don't have to live in a place of guilt and shame. You don't have to live in a broken place. Christ set you free, but he invites you and me into the process of cultivating our mind so that we can live in that freedom. Aren't you ready for that? Aren't you tired of saying one thing and trying to believe it and trying to work on it, but it never comes into place? It starts here. Paul said it like this. He said in, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, sorry, I think it's 2 or 10, 5. It says this, we demolish, that's a strong word. We tear down arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now again, this is not some spirit, how many of you have heard that verse before? Some of you guys have heard that verse before. That's just not a spiritual principle. That's a physical practice that we can do that we have the ability to capture our thoughts. Now what's crazy in the Greek, the word capture, it's a compound word and the first part of that word is with a spear. It is with authority and force that we have the ability to capture the not toxic thoughts in our life. And we must. Remember what Caroline Leaf said last week, we were looking at what she said, that every time we bring a thought to our conscious mind, it becomes malleable. We can change it. That's powerful. Every time a thought comes here and you think about it, it's changeable. Now the danger is, it will always change. You can either tear it down or you can reinforce it. See, the more times you think about toxic thoughts without confronting it with truth, it gets stronger. You ever been there? Where I just get so single-minded focused on this negative thought that it begins to just be iron in my mind. This is physical. That it literally gains proteins as we are thinking on it. It is strengthening and making bigger and longer connections in our mind to other thoughts. But that's also the hope. That these thoughts, every time we bring them to hear and think about them, they immediately, scientists say, are able to be transformed. But look, look at me. It takes effort. It is hard work. But the process is worth it. In Caroline's Leaf, another book she wrote, Cleaning Up Our Mental Mess, which that's a great one. I haven't read it, but I started previewing perusing some of the things she said, and she writes out five-step process that how the effort, the process of renewing our mind, taking our thoughts captive. I encourage you to, the other book that I told you that I have read talks about the process, and she has the dirty dozen, 12 different areas of toxicity in our mind. She talks about how to go through this process. A lot of places she's done some TED Talks. She interviewed with Stephen Furtick. There's a lot of out there about her talking about what she talks about. And so for sake of today, I summarize it down to four steps of truths that we can apply into our lives. And guys, I, I, I need you to hear this. This message isn't for entertainment purposes only. This message isn't just to sustain your time here. This message is for you to take, apply, and live out these doors. We've got to. We've got to begin to say, I'm going to take thought and capture them and change my mind. Why? Because we are called to live in a freedom that we're not living in. And two, a world needs to see a Jesus that's real. They don't need another church. They don't need another, me another preacher spitting a bun all over the place. They don't need another message. They need to see that there is a person that says, I believe Jesus is real, and I see the transformation in their lives. And that happens when we say, you know what? I'm going to process. I'm going to take this process. I'm going to partner with the Holy Spirit in my life because I want to change how I think so I can live in what he's promised me. So the first step is recognize. Last week, I gave you guys homework. Did you turn your homework in? Like, I don't know. Dog ate it. It's okay. No judgment here. Um, we, the first step we do is recognize, what are toxic thoughts in my life? We don't like doing that. 
I don't like doing that. I have a tendency when something negative or something I don't like, some toxic feeling, I want to I wanna smother it. Right? I, want, I don't want to think about it. I change the focus. I change the conversation. I, I, I got to go out and do something. I got to go have fun. I, I got I to I, I find habits that are addictive. I, I, I do things that make me mind numb so I don't have to think about that toxic thought in my life. But the fact of the matter is the first step in transforming your mind and in capturing your thoughts is you've got to begin to think, what are the toxic thoughts in my life? And here's what they are. How I think about myself, how I think about others, how I think about my future, how I think about my past, and how I think about God. What are those toxic thoughts? Begin, what are they? And see, here's the thing. Here's what's interesting. Our body is great at giving us signals that we have toxic thoughts in our mind. Can't sleep. Been there? Riddled by anxiety. I mean, paralyzing anxiety. Quick-tempered. It doesn't take much to set you off. You know what that is? That's your body telling you there is radioactive material loose upstairs. You want to hear another one? This one gets me every time. I was convicted in first gathering. Doesn't handle correction well. Oh, snap. That one? Come on. Someone corrects, pride swells, stubbornness kicks in, defensiveness. This is a body signal that there are toxic thoughts running a mess in your mind. Thoughts affect how we feel. They affect everything about us. You got to begin to say, you got to be willing to say, I need to say, why am I thinking this right now? Or what am I thinking? What is it? What is it about that I, 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 I see that person, I had this experience, and these thoughts fill my brain. What are they? I got to identify them. So the first thing is I, I recognize. And they may be proactive, which I think is a point, and I'm going to make it very clear. These four steps are something that, that, uh, Dr. Leaf says we do this process every day. You got to spend time doing this. It's what some of us may call meditation. And meditation is not the emptying of the mind, it's concentrating the mind on focus on certain things. We must take time. The, the scriptures of old said, I meditate on his word day and night. There is an intentionality, and I got to think, I got to bring these negative, toxic thoughts into my mind. What am I thinking? What do I think about this? The second step. After I recognize, two, I root out. Here's where you ask the question, why? Why do I think that? Why? And here's the hard part. Like I said last week in the second gathering, first gathering last week, there was a clinical psychologist that was there and he was talking to me afterwards and he said, look, some of these things have been ruined in our mind, they're deep. There was something that was spoken over you when you were a little kid. There's something you spoke over yourself when you were young. It may be even something you saw your parents model. Yikes. Ah. Responsibility of parenting. Maybe we'll do a parenting series coming up, right? Like, I need it. But these thoughts are rooted deep. And it takes deep thinking and time to begin to say, what are my toxic thoughts? What are they? When I think about myself, when I think about others, when I think about my future, when I think about my past, and when I think about God. And why? This is where we need help. The first place we can go is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person that seeks out and looks and learns the deep things of our life. This is hope. Because we, we're going to ask questions why, and we're going to continue and daily ask, and you're going to get more unveiled, unveiled, but the Holy Spirit can help. The Holy Spirit is a revealer. Look at the scripture when John, Jesus said, hey, I'm going away. I'm sending someone to you. He says this in John. He says, but when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. All truth. He will help you understand the deep things. He will not speak of his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now look at this verse, another verse. It says this. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, and we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely, freely given us. Look, I'm telling you, 
if you want to clean up the messy backyard, if you want to live in the freedom that Christ has died for, if you're tired of living in the guilt and shame, tired of living sabotaged by your thoughts, it's going to take hard work and say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me, help me understand the roots of why I think these thoughts about myself, about God, about others, about my future, about my past. Why? And he will begin to reveal. But see, there's something else. We have the Holy Spirit, and yes, we can do it on our own, but there's parts of it that are beyond our ability. And God has said, I want you to partner with others who can speak into your life. There is such thing as called counsel. I'm going to show you a scripture. This is in Proverbs. It says this. Surely you need guidance to wage war. What war are we waging? The war of our mind. As I said earlier, the Greek word has the carry of a spear. Look, we have a battle that we have to fight to capture and subdue the thoughts that are toxic in our life. It is a battle we have to wage war. He said, you need guidance in waging war. Victory is won through many, everybody said the word with me, advisors. Let me tell you something. Let me make this very clear. If you have known you need to go see a counselor and you've not gone, this is now the time to stop just saying, I'll deal with my own and go talk to someone else. Not seeing a counselor is opposite of what God speaks into our life. Because let me ask you a question. You go, you go I can change the oil in my car, but it goes to an advanced level that I don't understand. I go to the mechanic because he has the understanding and the tools to fix my problem. And none of us, for some reason, and I'll just pause for a second, some reason in the Christian world, we think if you go to counseling, you're weak. Oh, you just need God. That's all you need. That's a lie of the enemy. You don't call people weak when they take their car to the garage, do you? So weak. What's wrong with you? Same with medicine. I got a cold, I got something I understand, I take some over-counter medicine to help me, I, I know the steps I can take, I got some natural remedies, but there comes a point in my health journey that are things I don't understand, I don't know what's going on. What do I do? I go to the person who has the knowledge and has the tools to help me. Why do we not do that with our mental health? It is not weakness, it is wisdom. And for so long, the church has said, oh, you don't need to go to anybody. Let me tell you, today is the day Stop making excuses because if you want to win the war of your mind, there are some stories and some pieces that you need to root out that will only be taken by helping someone that has the knowledge and the tools to help you do so. Can I get an amen? Look. Again, are we ready to live free? Because here's the, here's the honest truth. This message goes nowhere. Because if you're like, no, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm content to be in this miserable place. Nobody's like that. Yeah, we are. Y'all with me? I mean, let's be real. It's church, right? Some of us go, yeah, I know I should, but I don't. Kind of learned to live here. One of the, the miracles and plagues that God sent is uh, uh, Egypt. And one of them was frogs. It was a crazy story that God was trying to get Egypt uncomfortable to finally let Israel go out of slavery. So he sends frogs, and they're everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Pharaoh's like, please, Moses, get rid of the frog. So Moses comes like, I'm going to get rid of the frog. Then he says, but wait, do it tomorrow. And his, in, the, in the translation, it says, one more night with the frogs. How many of us live this way? We don't have to raise our hands. We all do. We all know what the right thing is, but we're willing to sit in the frogs. We're not willing to do the work, nor do we believe that the work will produce the result. Based on scripture and science, this is a lie the enemy has sold you to let you stay living with the frogs. And God said, I came to set you free to live in that freedom. Live in it. So I, I look at it, so I first, I, I first recognize, then I root out what is it. She writes a suggestion in one of her books that it's good to write it down. To write out your thoughts. When you're processing, what are my text of thoughts and why? Start writing them down. I know that's archaic, right? You remember what a pencil looks like and a piece of paper? I know, it's hard to find in our house nowadays. But write them down because she says that writing these down actually gives clarity to our thoughts. 
It helps us look at our thought in a tangible way. We can see what we are thinking. But we can't stop there. Because remember the danger of bringing thoughts into your mind? They immediately when they come to the forefront of your mind, they're malleable and they will only do one of two things. They will either tear down or strengthen. There is no, I thought about it and it didn't affect me. Both are true. And so we must do the third point. It is vital. This is all happening within a, a set 30 to hour a day. This is when you're doing this. 30 minutes, you're, you're putting time to this. The third step is, I revise it. You see, I've got to, here's my toxic thought. I begin, I'm beginning to understand the why. Now I got to find truth that confronts that lie. I feel this, I think this, but truth says the opposite. I think we find truth according to what I believe truth is contained in God's word. That this is truth that helps help me form my thought processes and live my life. And let me give you a little, let me give you something that's really cool. Do you know actually worshiping and singing songs is a part of, of confronting the lies of your life? This is something I learned in that book I read that this has blew my mind. That yes, our mind creates thoughts to neurons. It's how the whole process works. But did you know your heart muscle also has its own set of neuron producing part? I, I, I'm not a scientist. Part thing? It actually sends simple thoughts to your mind. This is why I think worship is important. Because not only are we speaking the words, but music engages our emotions and hearts. And when we sing out the truth of who God is and who I am in Him, I am not only connecting my mind, I'm connecting my heart, and I begin to really begin to read or deconstruct the toxic thoughts in my life. But we've got to engage with what's being said. We've got to listen and think about the words. And we've got to let our hearts feel it. Y'all with me? We've got we to revise our thinking. Scripture says it like this, 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul talking to Timothy says, all Scripture is inspired, it means God breathed, and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do what is right. Next part of the verse 17, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, here's the thing. I grew up, the Bible was a beating stick. It was heavy, slap you across the face. They forgot there's two parts of that verse. Yes, it is to correct us and tell us the areas we're not doing it. But what's he say? Here's the purpose. It is to equip people to do all the good I have for them, to experience the life that I've given and died for. Scripture is a tool that we must engage with to confront the lies in our mind. And I can't trust my emotions, can you? I can't. My emotions are all over the place. I've been all over the place. One, literally the last hour, my emotions have been everywhere. <laughs> you know what else I can't trust? My experiences. We lean into those, don't we? You know, if you ask a police officer and they're asking for you to recount a traumatic experience in life, there's a large percent of that experience that you will, your mind will not remember or actually will change. We cannot depend totally on our emotions, our experience, we must revise our thinking by taking Scripture and applying it to it. This is also a place where you find a safe place to share. People that you are comfortable with to share your greatest, rawest feelings with and allow them to speak into your life. We need community. We need it. This is why church, church is not like checklist. Church is not a, I just do this so many mornings that God makes God happy with me. No, no. Church is a body of believers who come together to hear truth, to speak truth into others, into each other so that we can transform our minds so that we can live the life that God's called us to live. We must engage. We must revise what we're thinking. We've got to confront it. And then fourth, when we're done, resolve. This is faith. Resolve means based on what I have just heard, read, and now know that's truth. How am I going to change? What's the step I'm going to take? I would say write it down. It's powerful. Writing is a powerful tool. And, and you know, the beautiful thing is we can go a little modern. You can run on your phone, which is awesome, right? So 
Before I started Radius almost nine years ago, I was in a really a dark place, man. I didn't know if God was done with me. I didn't know what the future was. The future seemed bleak in my life. I felt God was mad at me and didn't want nothing want from me. I dealt with so much guilt and shame of choices I made in my life. I had so much, my mind was a mess. Because God, for a moment in my life, allowed me to have some space. I didn't even know this was what we were supposed to do, but I think the Holy Spirit helped us. And God knows he will always help us. I begin to say, I got to know what's true. And so I begin to look at scripture and then take that scripture and write it in a way that applies to my life. And I wrote them down. And for, I can remember for at least a month straight, I was saying, the, I call them my personal mantras. And I said this one, I am loved by God. I am created and equipped to do what he's called me to do. And that is enough. I didn't believe that, but I needed to speak it because of what the truth was speaking in my life. And so I had to write down, and I spoke that even when I didn't feel it. And I kept speaking it. Another one, the fear of man keeps me from being a servant of God. Another one that I wrote down, I cannot agonize over past decisions. I must learn and move forward. I had to write these down, and then I had to speak them. Because it's interesting that the Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And that is truth. You want to live, they begin to speak the truth of God over yourself. Take what is true and speak it. Write these things down. You got to be resolved. Yes, I, I know this is a toxic thought. This is a toxic experience, action, feeling. And I, I'm beginning to understand why. This process, it, it takes weeks and months to go through. I'm, I'm, it's hard work, guys. I'm not going to sell you to it. It's easy. And let me tell you this right now. I, we want God to do the impossible. We, want, we also want God to do the possible. We want him to do everything. I want, this is how I want to live my faith sometimes. Sit in a chair and God just do it all. That's not how God works. Let me tell you something. God will only do the impossible when you step to the edge of what you can do possible. You hear me? We want God to, God says, no, no, no. I've given you what you need to take the steps to the edge of your possible and then I'll show up and do the impossible. You say, I don't know if that's true. Let me tell you scripture. The story in the Old Testament. Israel has promised, this is your promised land. This is where you're going. There was a raging river that was overflowing its boundaries and God said, go take that because it's already yours. And so Israel's like, okay, God, when are you going to stop the water? And he doesn't. In fact, he says, okay, start marching. Now, don't get too stained glass about this story. This is, this is, imagine being the first person in line walking towards this raging river. This doesn't make sense. What's going to happen? Am I going to look like an idiot? Am I going to get swept away? But God's commanded me, I'm going to keep taking what I can do. I can take the next step. The Bible says, as they took steps, until they came, listen to me, until they came to the river edge, and when the first person put their foot in the water, then God showed up and stopped the water. You see, we're wanting God to do the miraculous, but we're not willing to do the work to get to the place where we need him to show up. Someone say, I don't want to believe God's real. And every time I've doubted God in my life, it's because I've been sitting still. God will show up when you take a step. He said, I don't know if I believe that still. Let me tell you another story. New Testament story. God's teaching a story about who he is. He says, let me tell you about a prodigal son. This boy says, I hate you, Father, and I'm going to go live my own life. And he does his own thing. But then he has a process of realizing his intention, effort, and time. And he turns around and says, I'm going to go back to my father. I'm not worthy to be his son, but at least I can work at his house. And he starts taking a step back. He takes a step back, and here's what's beautiful about the story. As he begins to walk, the Bible says that the father saw him from far away and came running. And embraced him and spoke over him what no one else could speak. No, 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 you're not going to be a person that works in my house. You are my son. This is God. You do what's possible. You take the steps you need to take and see when God shows up running your way to do what you cannot do. But stop standing still. Stop making excuses. Stop saying God's not there for me. There must be something wrong with me. There must be something wrong with God. God says, I've invited you to the story. Engage. And I will do what no one else can do, but you got to do your part. So I began to write. I put action to this. Because I believe this to be true now, I am going to dot, dot, dot. And let's be real. As you first do this, maybe the first week, 
you're going to have a lot of the first part, like I, can, I know this toxic thought, I know this toxic thought, I know this toxic thought, and I'm beginning, as I continue this process, to understand some of the whys. I'm going to start to go to counseling. I get some of the whys. The Holy Spirit reveals some of the whys. It's going to get heavy on the front end. But as you continue the process, it's going to switch. You're going to start having the truth you know about who God is, and then you're going to start being able to live out the truth you've planted. And here's what's powerful. Remember, it's, it's intention, it's effort, and it's time. Dr. Leaf says that you need to have this type of a, a cultivating your mind every day. And for 21 days, you spend working on this toxic thought. She said, this is crazy. If you spend less than 21 days, that thought, again, I'm not a scientist. I never played one on TV. I just read a book, all right? So you check it for yourself. By the way, never take for what I'm saying for face value. Go and study it for yourself. You hear me? My job is not to tell you how to live. My job is to say, here's what I've read, and Holy Spirit, help me to speak truth into your lives. But never take it from the person on stage talking. Go live it out. Go explore it. Go research it. Dr. Caroline Leaf, check her out. She says this, that as a thought is formed, it needs electronic pulse to, to bring it life. For up to 20, till the 21st day, it is a conscious effort to bring life to that thought. But after 21 days... That thought is self-sustaining. It has its own energy. It will keep there. Guys, some of you guys, I, 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 had this, I heard a message here. I thought this thought, and I got this truth from God, and I, I lived it out, and I meditated on for like a week, and then it faded away. You? Some of you got real spiritual and did it for two weeks. I'm like, man, I need a button for that. 21 days of intentional, deep thinking with the negative thought and confronting it and revising it with truth will sustain a changing thought in your mind. And then she says 63 days becomes a habit that transforms your mindset and your attitude and experiencing life. What are we doing? What are we doing? I'm tired of playing religion. I'm tired of just the mold and conformity of church. I want to experience the life that Jesus came to give me, that he sacrificed his life and rose from the dead for. And he says, hey, you ready for freedom? Transform your life thinking, faith taking, capturing the thoughts and bringing them into obedience to God. So my homework, you ready for homework today? Start that process today. You may already know, I got five, six that. Just think of one, th think area of my life that's toxic, because here's the truth. Probably one toxic thought carries a lot of different emotions and affects a lot of different parts of your life. Find scripture. There's great concordance. Like, I have this anger problem. Simply go online. Verses about anger. Read them and then begin to confront this feeling. I, 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 whatever it is, confront it with truth. Spend time. And you will see your mind cultivated and you will see yourself living the freedom that Christ has called to live with you. Amen? Whew. This is a little long, last we got early, so I gave you an extra 10 minutes this week on me. So I'm thankful for you. I pray that you live in this truth. Next week, guys, you, we're going to finish next week with this thought. This is, all prevent, this is all restorative medicine. This is all like we all have these things already in our life, and we're going to work on getting free. The scripture and science gives us ways that we can prevent ourselves from ever letting toxic thoughts take root. Because we're looking on the path, we've got a future in front of us, and I promise you, you do not want to miss next week as we conclude our series talking about how we prevent ourselves from allowing those thoughts to take root and sabotage our lives. Invite a friend, be here, because God's got a word for you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your great love for us. Lord, God, my heart burden and beats with the the, the desire to see everyone in this room live in the freedom that you've given us.
And for so long, we've been willing to, to sit it and say, well, that's just who I am. That's just how I'm going to do it. I don't want to change. But God, we have given up on more. We've given up on living in peace and joy, the living in faith and living in forgiveness. We've given up on it. But you call us today to bring those thoughts into captivity, to hold them at spear point and begin to change how we think. Lord, I be with anybody online listening today. May they hear the truth. Lord, every person in this room, may they hear the truth and may they begin to apply it to their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. Amen. Thank you, Blake. Now, as we transition to a time of giving, we stay here a radius that generosity generates goodness, and we get to see all the time the goodness that your generosity is generating, not only in our faith community, but in our community and throughout the world. So thank you for that. We want to let you know that there's a couple ways that you can give. You can go to radchurch.com slash giving. It's going to give you an opportunity to do a one-time gift, or you can do a reoccurring gift, whichever is most convenient for you. If you're here in person, there is a contactless box in the lobby. You can use that also. And wanted to let you know, um, if you have given to Radius this last year, giving statements go out this week. So you'll be receiving those in the mail. So keep a look out for those. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day. Music.